Hello, this is Jeffrey Fox. Now we have uh, the last lesson in uh, the third unit of the physics use case, which describes some aspect of using statistics in physics. This is illustrated by this uh, file Higgs class 3.py, which is available on FutureGrid and on um, the uh, files uh, tab of the online class. The first uh, slide comes from Wikipedia, the source of a lot of wisdom. And it just tells you what a standard deviation is. We take our famous Gaussian or normal distribution shown here. And these areas represent probability. So 31, if you add all these numbers up, 2.1%, 0.1%, 31.6%, 34.1%. Well, all those add up to 50%, because that's the chance that the event is uh, above the mean, and then another 50% is below the mean. And you can see the nice bell-shaped curve falling off, uh, like the, the exponential squared. And then we have the problem, then the interpretation of um, standard deviation is shown rather clearly here. Here's uh, the mean minus the standard deviation. Here is the mean plus the standard deviation. And we have in this region here, 68.2% of the data. So it's quite likely actually you're outside one standard deviation, because a third of the events will have that property. But once you start getting up to three sigma, it's pretty small. Uh, between three and two is a chance of 2%, between two and one, 13%, 13.6%. That's one side, you double this for the two-sided. Uh, some, but so you can say three sigmas are pretty solid. Um, Cut, there's only 0.1% a chance of being bigger than three sigma, or 0.2% adding it up both sides. I mentioned um, later on in uh, lesson four that there is a subtlety here that if you really look at a huge number of plots, like a thousand plots, something which happens 0.1% of the time either way, will actually happen on two, two plots. So you have to be a little careful. Three sigma seen twice in an analysis where you make a thousand separate um, histograms is not significant. You need to fold in that fact. So anyway, this is, these are important. Uh, features of the uh, Gaussian distribution. Another important point is, which comes back to the systematic and statistical error. In practice, you, there are, you will also get deviations from the mean due to, due to non-Gaussian errors, like gross blunders in uh, pattern recognition. You know, we have all those particles, and we add to uh, form those particles into tracks. Well, actually, we do that with uh, this is a famous MP complete problem of associating measurements with tracks. It's a track finding problem used in physics, also used in the famous strategic defense initiative to track missiles and stuff like that. In fact, it probably is used still to track missiles on, on military aircraft. So when you have lots of particles, you can make mistakes and associate a an ionization of one particle with a different particle, so that will actually give you an incorrect measurement, which will not be governed by a Gaussian distribution. In fact, who knows what it's governed by? Um, and so you will find that in practice, measurement errors are actually broader than Gaussian. They're not falling off like this exponential square. And you need to bear that in mind. You can um, use your actually famous Monte Carlo um, analysis where you generate um, known events and run them through the apparatus and analyze them with your software, you can estimate these effects. Because uh, with Monte Carlo data, which actually tends to be cleaner than real data, but still has a lot of the same problems. When you have multiple tracks, they will actually interfere. Uh, one of the one problem of track finding of multiple, multiple um, signals. And so you can estimate that effect from the Monte Carlo data, because the huge advantage of Monte Carlo data, you know the exact answer. So you know what to associate things with. And you can see if your software does it right. 
when I wrote the analysis for one of these experiments, I certainly tested in the fashion. And that was whenever it was, 1975 or something. So that was a while ago. Then we, this sort of comes back to, well, is this stuff right? I've already sort of introduced this concept. There are these mathematical corrections, which you can wax on forever because they're mathematics. And we saw that uh, we actually redid 25 with 250 because 25 did not exhibit exact Gaussians. It was low on one side and high on the other side. Um, so that's what they're playing from above the mean, it's above the Gaussians. And that's essentially trivial because if you wanted to, you could correct it because you know the exact distribution of the mean is 25. And it's really very unimportant. Uh, these types of mathematical corrections are, can be ignored. Far more serious are these biases. I mentioned the type of bias that we had in the physics experiments of uh, multiple track finding or uh, <coughs> in the case of, say, photons entering a calorimeter, sometimes the photons get mixed up because they cross each other. Either because um, it depends exactly how you divide, divide the, design the apparatus as either likely or possible. And the experiment I did with photons, which actually gave really accurate answers, and I, I'm always very pleased because I did tens of millions of these squares uh, fits in that for that data, and which made me happy because. I like these squares fits, especially these were non-linear these squares fits, and I wrote very nice uh, programs to do that. Anyway, that again was 1975. Nowadays it's probably trivial, but in those days it wasn't. So the other type, so here's another illustration of bias. It's not that the apparatus is, you mismatch the association of, of um, measurement to, sit to uh, what you're fitting. I mean, this is the well-known issue. You're fitting models to the data. If the model's wrong, you have a bias. And it's, it's non-trivial to get a model which is reasonable. You give it too many parameters, it, there's one sort of problem. If you give not enough parameters or the wrong parameters, the wrong number of events or something like that, then you get a real problem. Anyway, if we come back to this, this other one, an example on biases, they're all so, even today, this was true in 1975, and it's true today, that if you, uh, it's very easy to do surveys with biased answers. Here's this uh, example here, Bloomington tends to be somewhat more democratic than the rest of the state. So if you survey Indiana politics in Bloomington and extrapolate the state, you'll get uh, completely the wrong answer. So that's a simple bias, and of course, people who are good at the surveys correct for that by taking an appropriate distribution of people. Even so, the surveys even today, different surveys give very different answers as to the same thing, and that a lot of that must be due to biases. It's not due to statistics, because political surveys tend to have from 600 to maybe 3,000 um, um, People in the survey and the statistical bias is not, the statistical error is not the reason they differ. I mean, they differ a little due to statistical error. But the reason for the wide variation is due to bias. They ask slightly different questions which bias the uh, answers, or they, or, they, or they actually just make an error. Answering questions, taking questions differently can lead uh, to get a, like you can ask the question about who you like in different ways and depending on. But in English is more or less the same way, it can give very different um, reactions to people. So that's sort of pretty non-trivial, I would expect. On the other hand, trying to uh, give a unbiased sample of data so you have a proper, proper uh, demographics, which is, covers the national demographics, if you're trying to get a national answer, that is probably well understood how to do. Whether or not people do it right, I don't know. And as I've mentioned, we do multiple different experiments, two major ones to measure almost anything, because we want to address bias. So if you see uh, Higgs in two experiments, which is what they did, they saw it in CMS, they saw it in Atlas, that means we believe it. And you're less worried that the observations are the fact that were misunderstood apparatus. I should say physicists sometimes, well actually any, you still get wrong answers because you have a single experiment, 
it's analyzed honestly and rigorously and as the best of people can do. But with one apparatus, which is this complicated, is is quite. It is almost inevitable you make mistakes, and the best way to avoid uh, mistakes is do it twice. I always used to do that with complicated computer programs. I always wrote two, because I never believed one, because when you write, especially in physics, where you care what the answer is, and there's just lots and lots of arithmetic, it's so easy to make a mistake or to do something like, I remember I spent a long time once trying to find an error in a program, and I got two of them, and they gave different answers. One of them had some rounding, because somehow I had to find something as an integer, not a floating point, and it rounded it off to integers, and then got the wrong answer. That I spent a long time to find, and I found it because I wrote two programs. Anyway, addressing bias is important, and uh, CERN does it, you should do it, we should all do it. This next set of slides, which is the last set, uh, correspond to um, showing that um, what happens when you uh, do smaller plots with, uh, sorry, s smaller experiments. Here we, uh, instead of doing a million people, sorry, instead of doing 10 million people, we do uh, 100,000 people. So we take 250 events and we count them 400 times. Um, and we'll get this rather raggedy looking graph here. Here's the normal, the appropriate normal distribution. Here's our histogram um, with 250s living somewhere around here. And it's pretty raggedy. Notice that the top is 10, the square root of 10 is 3. And we're roughly only, and so we're, these results are not inconsistent with, uh, with 10. And so uh, you're just seeing the typical fluctuations you will get in any, um, experiment of this size. Um, we can uh, actually do do another experiment like this by just rerunning the Python code. Python always gives you different answers by default. That's, we'll discuss that in the next lecture. Um, and so it's again raggedy, but it's just raggedy in a different fashion. So you could say, well, this looks pretty messy, and actually, if you looked at that, and you would tend to say, well, that's we've chosen the wrong bin size for our histogram. We will uh, choose a, a smaller bin size, sorry, a larger bin size. And here we've chosen a bin size, not a one, but a five. And um, now we have around 50 events instead of a 10 events, the error is still larger, 7, square root of 50 is 7. By going to a larger bins, we've only got a factor of root 5, but a relative better in the error, but still it looks a lot smoother and it's uh, probably a, for, if you happen to do an experiment like this, you, you probably want to use this type of bin size and not the bin size you had at the previous case of 1. Really, that's so jet raggedy you couldn't really, really interpret it. So this points out something you need to do with this type of analysis. You need to you need to think a little carefully about um, um, how to present the data. Uh, this is just the same thing done a second time again with another seed, and it actually looks this one looks a little prettier. But that's just life; it just happens. This run was a little prettier. Runs are runs are runs. Each run is an independent experiment, and you will get different errors each time. So that's the end of that particular discussion. Uh, we will discuss this issue of um, actually Python having different random numbers each time in the next lecture.